So we got this beautiful person here. I'm Tommy, you know me, yes. Um, this is Arky Music Talks, it's happening every month. And it's about educating musicians how to think and be entrepreneurs and change eventually the whole world's mindset about how to approach music. If you want to be social, and you better be social, and if you want to rant about it, just use that one, please. So I can check out who said bad things about me, then block them from Facebook. Um, so, this is a discussion, right? It just, this is your stage. This is going to go around. It's not for me, it's not for Indiegogo, it's not it's for, for everybody here to ask questions and, and get something out of it. So, it's your stage. Um, and, good luck. Right, so I would like to thank London Fusion for providing us this beautiful space and all the equipment and all the coffee you've run. Uh, London Fusion, so Andre is the facilitator. He will let you know later what's happening with London Fusion. You might be interested in this. But for now, that, that's it. And yeah, thank you. So, uh, hello, I'm Anastasia, and I lead marketing uh, and community for Indiegogo. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for, to London Fusion for having me, and to Tommy, obviously, for organizing it. These things are amazing. I've been to a couple of them, um, and me and Tommy got talking, and he was like, oh, you should do a presentation. So, here I am. Um, so, yes, if you are tweeting about the event, which you should be, um, then you can follow us at Indiegogo UK, and... Go Go Music, and obviously Darker Music Talks is the hashtag. Um, that's my email up there. You can contact me any time of day, um, and I will reply. I'm the only one at that uh, email, because I look after the whole of the UK, so that's kind of fun. Um, so if I don't respond to you really quickly, just badger me publicly on Twitter, and then I'll be like publicly shamed to reply really quickly. It's <laughs> a good idea. Um, so yeah, so I lead marketing and community for Indiegogo. Um, how many people kind of know about crowdfunding? Like, show of hands, everyone know what it is? Yeah, OK, cool. Uh, how many people know what Indiegogo is? Okay, it's not bad. I can go home. That's quite good. Um, cool. And how many people have run a crowdfunding campaign? You two. Amazing. So I, I spoke to you about. Uh, did I speak to you about your crowdfunding campaign? No. No. I just spoke to you in general. Yeah. That was great, by the way. Coffee. Yeah, coffee's good. Um, what was your What was your crowdfunding campaign, and what platform did you? My most recent EP, and I used. I actually used something called Music Razor. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Before I even knew I was going to do EP, they, they wrote to me and said, hey, we like what you do. We're trying to break out of Italy. If you ever want to do something, do it with us. That's cool. So, yeah. You sound very cool. Italy's great. Um, and what was yours? Ours was, uh, I think, it's Yeah. Very cool. Nice. Uh, pledge music to fund the album. Um, OK, so first of all, uh, Indiegogo is about community. So if you're only the person sat next to you or behind you or on your table, then quickly say hello. Go. Hello, Lorenzo, you were late. Has everyone said hello? Yes. Cool. Because the thing is, you never know who might be sat next to you. You might be able to collaborate with them or help out in, in some way. OK, so for anyone that doesn't. Sorry. Quick thing. Yeah. So we can get perfect sound for everybody all over the world watching. If you want to say something, let's do it this way. But it's microphone. Yeah. Cool. So anyone who doesn't know, which I pretty think you all are very expert in it, but um, it's not begging, as what a lot of people think it is. It's the pooling of funds to make your dream happen, whether it's to like fund your album or go on tour. Um, and it's very much about involving people in the creative process rather than like holding your hand out for money. So that's kind of the important messaging to think about it. Um, so Indiegogo, I won't kind of focus on Indiegogo that much because it's about your questions and crowdfunding and how to successfully do it. Um, but we were the first global crowdfunding platform in two, that set up in 2008. And there's three founders, and they pretty much had one mission of democratizing finance. So they all had issues. One of them wanted to raise money for cancer research. One of them was for film. Another one is in creative as well. And they couldn't understand why the majority of the population was locked out of traditional finance, whether that's loans or investors. And so they set about trying to do something about it, which is uh, how Indiegogo came about, which is amazing. Um, so they were right there at the beginning kind of pioneering this and, and enabling this platform. And so these are kind of the things that 
make us a little bit different. The only reason I'm talking about them is because they're important for you to know in how relevant they are for you um, when choosing a platform or whatever. Um, so because the founders wanted to democratize finance, the platform had to be open. So we are 100% open. Uh, there's no application process. You could set up a campaign right now. If you get bored of me, just set one up. Something to do. Um, and there's no gatekeepers. So the whole point of crowdfunding is letting the crowd decide and it being a, demo a democratic process. If the crowd doesn't think what you're doing is amazing, they won't fund it. And the kind of end goal is that one day the world will fund things that deserve to be funded rather than fund things that a few people behind desks think should be funded. Um, so yeah, no gatekeepers, completely open. You can just set it up straight away. We're global, so we kind of, right from the beginning, if you want to democratize anything, it's got to be around the world. We're in over 190 countries. Um, all the stats are kind of there. I won't go on about them. But the reason that's important is because you have fans everywhere, all over the world. You might not even be from the UK. You might be from another country, and you certainly have fans from different countries. So when you're launching a crowdfunding campaign, it needs to speak to where your audience is. And also, you don't really know where your audience is. You might know of a certain few markets where you're really strong, but there could be an amazing fan base in Lithuania or Poland. You had no idea. And then you're like, oh my god, this is amazing. I'm going to go and like, speak to them and gig in, uh, in their town. So being global is really, really important. And also, we're in different currencies and different languages. So if you were 100% sure that your campaign, your contributors were going to be Spanish, and it was going to be very, very big in, in Spanish-speaking countries, you could put your whole campaign in Spanish. So it's English, French, Spanish, and uh, German. So that's why it's kind of important. The other big differentiator is, um, so we offer two types of funding. Flexible, I know, I always feel a bit weird when I look at that slide. Um, I feel like I shouldn't look. Uh, so flexible versus fixed funding. Um, and basically, the reason is, so fixed funding, if you don't know, is where you pick a goal, and if you say it's £10,000, even if you raise nine and a half, you don't get any of the money. All the money gets sent back. It's just a pledge. So you do all the work, and you don't get any of the money, which kind of sucks. And it kind of works in... Um, for technology campaigns sometimes. So if you're producing a piece of hardware and you can't even make one unless you get 200,000 pounds because you need to buy a mold or you need to pay a manufacturer, then it makes sense to do fixed funding. But generally in life, most projects, you never raise the whole amount of money that you need to raise. It always goes in stages. And it might just be that you get a loan or your mum and dad give you some money or you raise a bit of money and then you get a bit more money and it kind of goes up in stages. So it's really important to think about a campaign as getting to the next level. Like, what's the minimum you need to get to the next level? Um, and so we offer flexible funding, because create, in the creative world, a lot of the time, you don't know how much money you necessarily need. You always want, like, £100,000. It's great. Um, but being able to have the option to set your goal at £5,000, and then you never know, you might raise 150000 but you don't know, and you raise all that money. So even if you raise four and a half, you would get it all. So that's why flexible funding is important. It's completely up to you. Um, and then the kind of other thing is we're completely merits-based. So it doesn't matter if you're raising £2,000 or £50,000. You have the same chance to get on our homepage and our newsletters on being pushed out on Twitter. Um, so we have the go-go factor, which is pretty cool. Um, it's like a special recipe of lots of different things that go into it. So it's like how much traction you're getting, how many updates you're getting. So are you actually engaging with the people that are looking at your campaign? Um, how much traffic you're driving? Lots of different things, as well as the, the money side of things. So if you have a high go-go factor, then you get on the homepage. You get in the newsletter, which goes out to so many people. And though, that's when you kind of start really tapping into the Indiegogo global community. So you want to kind of work hard. Um, and the last thing is um, we are here to help you. That's literally the only reason this, this company was set up. We've got a whole team in California. Um, so we're San Francisco based, by the way, in case you didn't know. Um, they're actually called the happiness team. And it's like the most Californian thing in the, in the world. It's amazing. And they're all really happy. So I went there last week, and I was really like cynical and bitter and British. And they were like, hi, nice to meet you. Can I help you? And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I used to go home. Um, but they are really happy. And they will answer your questions seven days a week um, within pretty much about 24 hours or less, which 
if any of you run a campaign, that's really important. If you have a nightmare and you need somebody to email and be on the other end of a uh, email, it's really key. And so that's the kind of global and the local is me. So you can have my mobile number and you can badge me at midnight. It happens, trust me. Uh, so yeah, you can ring me if you just have a question or you just need some advice. Um, I'm here, I'm based out of kind of Old Street. So I can come and have coffee. I like coffee. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're here to I drink a lot of coffee. Um, OK, so now this gets on to the fun stuff. So the reason, I'll kind of move on to why people crowdfund for music and why it's amazing for uh, independent artists. But the point is that you can fund anything on Indiegogo. It literally, the world's your oyster. Um, this, that was actually We The Kings. They raised 149000 But so when people think about crowdfunding for music, they just think about their album. They think, oh, I, I need to put out my next EP. Um, I'm going to crowdfund for it which is a perfectly good reason to crowdfund. So these guys um, are Canadian band, I don't know whether you know about them, uh, Protest the Hero. They were out of their label in Canada, and no one was really interested, um, so they were kind of a bit stuck. So they came on Indiegogo, they were like, screw it, we're just going to go straight to our fan base. If they want us to you know, go back out and tour, then we'll do it. And they did. Their, t their fans really did. So they raised $340,000. And then guess who was knocking down their doors and like ringing them? All the labels wanting to sign them. And so they had their pick. And um, they did actually end up signing with something Razor. I can't remember now. Um, and the only reason they did that, because they didn't need the money at that point and they didn't need the exposure. But the reason they did that was they wanted to kind of tap into another different market in terms of putting albums in shops and that kind of thing. Um, but all the power was on their side at that point for negotiations, having ownership over their music, because suddenly they proved their, their music. They proved their fan base. They proved publicly that there was a huge demand for them and for them seeing. Um, so they did amazingly well. Uh, you can also fund your tour. So a lot of labels at the moment just don't have the money for tours. Um, or if you particularly want to tour in Australia or America, they just don't have budget. Um, and that was kind of what happened with these guys. They wanted to go on tour, but they, their label just didn't have, have the money. So they raised 52000 to go on tour and, uh, and went exactly where they wanted to. And I'll kind of come on to this later, but the great thing is the people that funded them get to see them like two, three months later. And it's like you're sat in the crowd saying, I put them on that stage. And that's an amazingly empowering thing. Um, so yeah, it's anything. So like your documentary, um, Architects, Brighton over here. So they wanted to do, they were doing this world uh, tour and they wanted to make this crazy video. And it was a bit quirky and a bit different. Uh, they label like, no, it's a terrible idea. We're not going to give you money for that. Um, so they went on Indiegogo and raised £40,000, which is a lot, because pounds to dollars, it's, it's usually not that much. Um, it's not comparable. So they raised 40000 over their goal and proved that people did actually want to see this. And it's an amazing, amazing film. I'll, um, I can send it out to you later. Um, and then obviously uh, music videos. So these guys, this was actually market validation more than anything. And the goal wasn't huge, but they wanted to do a crazy music video didn't have support for it, and so they raised six and a half grand to, to do that. Um, and again, kind of the other ones are like very much 340,000. That's a huge campaign. They, they're very well known, they have a huge fan base. Uh, you shouldn't kind of necessarily be put off by the fact that that's a huge amount of money because this campaign is just as important. Um, as long as you know what you're raising for and you have a really strong story, it doesn't matter. Um, oh, and you can fund your misfortunes. So these guys, poor guys, were, um, were, they did a gig in Buffalo, and they went to have some dinner, and then their locks were broken into while they were eating, and they got $30,000 worth of equipment stolen at, like, while they were like, s sat eating. So their tour manager, um, they were gutted. Their tour manager the next day set up this campaign, and they, they, this was on... Saturday morning, so yeah, Friday night they, they gigged, lost all the equipment. Saturday morning, the tour manager set it up. Saturday night, they hit 30 grand. Yeah. So, Schadenfreude, people love it. 
Uh, I, we actually, I was in San Francisco last week because um, we have a quarterly conference, so it was amazing. I got to go out there, and um, we part of the conference we get we get people in some of our campaigners. So we had this really cool band that came in, and they'd actually funded they. Um, Someone had broken into their car, and they they'd stolen their guitar and all this other stuff, and they raised I think about seven or eight, uh, seven to ten thousand on Indiegogo. And they came in and they like played us this gig. It was amazing. I was so excited. It was like a groupie. Um, but yeah, so if something bad happens, turn it to your advantage. So th these are UK um, as well. Very cool. Very cool band. Why crowdfund music? Um, you could say because the music industry is completely messed up right now and people want ownership over their, uh, their content and their art. There's a lot of reasons. Um, these are kind of the main ones. And my talk was titled Crowdfunding is Not About Money, um, which is a little bit controversial because uh, a lot of people think, mainly because of the word crowdfunding, they think that crowd gives you money and it doesn't work like that. Um, there are so many other things that you get out of running a crowdfunding campaign other than money. And equally, it's not the crowd that funds you first, which I'll come on to. So the benefits for musicians and bands and artists is that unlike any other way before, you get to engage directly with your community, with your fans. And you can offer them amazing experiences that they wouldn't be able to tap into elsewhere. Either they'd be restricted by your label or you just don't have the capacity or you just there's always a middleman. So you get rid of the middleman and you just go directly, like what Protest the Hero did. They just went straight to their fans and said, do you care about us? Do you still want us to be out doing what we're doing? And they were like, yeah, I really do. And the thing is, people are voting with their money. They're not saying, that it's, this isn't like a Facebook like or a retweet. They're actually giving you money to go and do it. So it's very empowering on both sides and that kind of messaging is important like when you're if you're crowdfunding just for money you're doing it wrong and you're not going to you're not going to succeed um, it's very much about involving your fans in the creative process and kind of having this army that you build up and like taking them along the journey and along the way because they will be your avid supporters and they will spread your word and do all your marketing for you um, it's amazing so engaging with your fans is, is probably the biggest one. Uh, gaining visibility, again, is huge. So if you, you know, it doesn't matter if you're not that well known. If you have a really solid core group of fans, they're going to be shouting about you. And once they fund you on Indiegogo, they're going to post it on Twitter and on Facebook and on all the different music blogs. And people are going to see you and they're going to be like, oh, I might just listen to that. I might just go to that campaign. And even if they don't end up funding you, they've seen you. And they wouldn't have seen you otherwise. So um, there's kind of always a debate about going on music-only crowdfunding sites and that kind of thing. And um, it's completely, like, Pledge is amazing. But what's really great about being on, or being able to access a global platform is that you don't necessarily know um, who you're going to be able to tap into. So it could be that your, one of your amazing fans shares this and then somebody else listens to your music and thinks, that's amazing, I really like it, and shares it to another 10 people. And those people you wouldn't have accessed before. Um, so it's great. Data, um, it sounds boring, but it's very powerful. So when people contribute to your campaign, you have a campaigner dashboard. So you get to see who's contributed. You get to see whether they're female or male. You get to see uh, where they're from. So suddenly you have all this data about the demographics of your fan base. You know that you have a huge fan base in Lithuania or Poland or whatever, and you can suddenly start working towards that. You can decide to go and tour there, or you can think about ways to kind of maximize on those new markets that you had no idea that you had. And it also gives you power because you can go back, you can go to a label or you can go to someone and say, look, these are the people, they put their money into us, and I can tell you who they are and what they are. And if you've got all of those email lists, when your next album comes out or your next tour is going on, uh, guess who, who's going to be the first people to want to hear about it then? So it's a very good way of kind of building on the momentum of not just having one campaign and letting it lie, um, which is what a lot of people do. But you should definitely, there's an update section in the campaign and you should treat it like your blog. You know, even when the campaign's over, treat it like your blog, like send out information, keep people updated. They've opted in to be part of that process. So they, it's not spamming them. It's like including them. And obviously raising money, which, yeah, everyone wants money. So I don't need to explain that. <laughs> 
Um, so we're actually running a workshop um, which will be focused on how to successfully uh, set up your campaign. So that'll be in a few weeks. You can speak to Tommy about that. Um, so I'll go into, in that workshop, I will actually, I'm going to get people to come with a kind of a draft campaign and then go through each part. So you leave with a, a campaign kind of ready to go. So I'll kind of like go over this and then we can talk whatever. So what makes a good campaign? Um, a com compelling pitch. So with crowdfunding, it's very much about who are you? What have you done? Why, why should I care? Like what, what can I see that you know, you've been really passionate about? And very much personalizing it. Um, what are you raising money for? Is it a tour? Is it a van? Like people have raised money just to buy a van to go on tour. Um, are you bringing out an album? Be very clear about where the money's going. So crowdfunding works on a premise of being transparent and open and honest. So the more transparent you can be about where the costs are going, the better. If you're just saying, I want to raise 50 grand um, just because, and I'm a rock star, and I'm going to go do rock star stuff, people won't fund you. Uh, so yeah, the, the more clear you can be, the better. Why are you crowdfunding? Is it because you want to get direct access to your fans? Is it because you want to move away from the traditional way the music industry works and trying to get someone to listen to your EP is impossible or trying to get signed by a label is nigh on impossible? Um, what, what are the reasons? Do you want to break down those barriers? So explain that. And how can you get people involved? If, even if people can't contribute, so a lot of people you know, don't necessarily have the financial means, can't give you money. There's so many other things they can do. They can email 10 people with your campaign who, think, who they think might be interested in it. They can share it on Twitter. They can introduce you to an influencer who might be able to tap into a bigger market. Storytelling is very important. You're all amazing at it, which is great. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot harder for me when I'm stood up in front of like hardware, a room of hardware people, and I'm like, storytelling. And they're like, no, this is my product. I'll tell you about the, uh, the back end and blah, blah, blah. So you're all really good at storytelling, so like, maximize on that. We had, um, is it in here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so pitch video. So the, the way your campaign's broken down is a video, um, the pitch text, and then your perks. So the video needs to be very much a pitch video. This isn't your music video. It's not a compilation of um, all of the things you've done from your tour or um, anything like that. It's not a showreel. It's a pitch video. You need to be on camera telling people who you are, why they should fund you, why they should care, and why you're so passionate about it. Um, because that's why people, people fund people, not projects, at the end of the day. There's actually four main reasons that people fund on Indiegogo, and we've got five years of data that we've mined to come up with trends. First one is people, so they know you, uh, they're your mum, they're your dad, they're your sister, they're in your network, they're Tommy. Um, he should actually be the first person to fund. Um, the second one is passion, so they just, they love what you're doing, they love indie music, they love rock music, they're obsessed by jazz, they just love it. That's the passion. Third one is participation. So this is a, this is a really strong motivation, actually. Uh, you're an accountant, but you really wanted to be a musician all your life. And your dad was like, no, nope, you've got to be an accountant. Um, and so it's kind of the idea that you want to participate in something that's bigger than yourself. So by funding an amazing band that you love, it's like you're part of the creative process. You're not. You're still doing accounting. But you feel like you're part of it. Um, so it's a really strong motivation to tap into. And the fourth one is perks which I will talk about. So just going back to the video, um, short, keep it, I'd probably say even like one and a half, two minutes is good. It's kind of very much online video content rules. Um, be honest, authentic. Um, the thing is you, again, you should kind of speak to your audience. You know who your fans are. You know what style you are. If you say shit, sorry, I just realized that's filming, um, and drink beer and, you know, love women or men, whatever, like say that in your video because the people watching it are going to relate to that. Like they, they, that's what they expect from you. Don't, don't suddenly think, oh, I have to take on a different persona. Like drink beer, swear. I won't swear anymore, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and be creative and be fun with it. So like we had a really cool uh, pitch video where this guitarist just made, like, made a song and sang his whole pitch video. And it was like cute and quirky and it told the story and it worked really well. So think outside the box. 
Um, okay, so these two campaigns, which one looks more successful? The left or the right? Right? Yeah? They raise the same amount of money, um, but the higher goal doesn't necessarily mean more money. When people go to Indiegogo or they go to your campaign because they've heard about it or they've seen a link, if they see that, you know, this guy's raised uh, 20,000 of 150,000, but if they see that, they're psychologically, you immediately think, that's not a great project. I'm not really that interested in it. Um, I don't think I'm going to fund it. Or I, maybe I'll come back later and see how it's doing. This one is 50,000. It looks like they're almost there. You know you want to be part of it. You need to get, on, get involved. The further along the kind of green bar goes, the more people don't want to miss out. The more people know that the project is validated. So people always choose a high goal because people always want lots of money. Um, but it doesn't, psychologically, it doesn't work that way. You have to, I always say, pick the most conservative amount of money that you can do whatever you're trying to do with. So if it's like you would ideally like 50,000 to do your next album, but you could start it and get on the road with like 15, try and raise 15. Um, um, and, and I had a discussion with, with the founder of Indiegogo at your last event, yeah. and she told me that um, eighty percent of the campaigns that reached forty percent, they actually got fully funded. Yeah. So the tricky part is how do you get to forty percent, fifty percent, more or less, and then, in like Google Factor or people will see you know that there is money raised here, probably I will help you know to to be part of this or something. Yeah. Eighty so percent gets funded. Eighty-seven percent of campaigns that reach their goal will exceed by an average of thirty-two percent. That's a huge amount of money. That's a third of the campaign. So. If you can get there, just the aim is get there as fast as you can. So on day, day one, you need to get off zero immediately. Um, so I always say soft launch maybe three days before. And in those three days, you need to be sending out to your family, your friends, your relatives, everybody. And you need to get the first 30%. So I'll go into this more in detail in the workshop. But the first 30% will generally come from your own network. So that's, that's what's quite difficult. So if you don't think, if you're, if you're trying to raise 15,000 pounds and you don't think you can raise five from your own network, your goal's too high. So you need to think about that. Um, and that first 30%, first once that comes in, the next 30% is generally from there in a circle. And it's only the last third that comes from the stranger dollars or pounds or whatever. So it's very much, it's kind of misleading being crowdfunding because the crowd does come in and they weigh in, but at the last, in the last hurdle. So the faster you can get up and hit your goal, the better. And you will overfund, like 32% is a high average of you overfunding. And by that point, it's already been validated. The public see that it's a cool project. They want to get behind it. Uh, you know, they might see that it's only got like three days left and it's already overfunded by $50,000 or $5,000. And they want to get behind it because they don't want to miss out. So, uh, yeah, so it's very, very important to kind of think about that. And enlist a team. If you are a solo musician or your band's really small, like, find people that can be part of the team. Like, get uh, interns or people that just admire you, fans, to be part of your team. Because the bigger your team, the more money you'll raise. So, it's bad background. But campaigns with a team raise 80% more money. And that's kind of based on... There's more people talking about it, so there's four people telling all of their family and friends instead of one person, um, and it's it's kind of a it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a crowdfunding is quite hard. Um, people think it's really easy. It's not. It's kind of horrendous, but in an amazing way. Um, but it's hard every day that you you have your campaign up there. You need to be working every day. You need to have planned a schedule before you launch uh, that you're going to do this on day one, this on day two, this on day five. I'm going to hit this milestone. I'm going to write a press release, or I'm going to do an update, or I'm going to do a quick little video saying thank you. Uh, it's, it's difficult in that it's time consuming and it's draining. So the more team, the bigger team you can have, the better chance you're going to get of raising lots of money. And then this is the best bit about musicians. So think outside the box when it comes to perks. So everyone kind of gets the concept of you put money, you have a goal, and then you give people back. Yeah. Oh, get the microphone. Um, what are the most successful perks over all your campaigns, if you were to like 
yeah. look, analyze all of them. So these are actually um, pretty those, much the ones up them. here. Okay. Anything where, no, no, it's fine. Anywhere, anything where you can um, give people an exclusive experience um, are very powerful. Because these people like your music. They like you. They've bought into a brand, into your lifestyle. So the fact that you can give them an exclusive experience, like coming on the road for the day, or having a coffee with them, or having a Skype chat if they're abroad, that's really powerful. And that's what you need to tap into. And the thing is, perks don't need to be expensive. So the more creative you can be, uh, the better. And you don't need to spend loads of money. When I was talking to Pledge Music, your arch nemesis, um, they said that autograph lyrics were like really big. Yeah. They did really well as well. Yeah, absolutely. So anything, so it's, it's um, an experience or something really personal or involving them in the process. So whether that's like writing a thank you in the inliner notes or saying you'll write a song about them. We've had some really successful campaigns where they've actually written for like a thousand pounds or something, they'll write a song about you. That's amazing. Your favorite band's writing a song about you. So like give it to your girlfriend, I'll help you get a date, whatever. I was a bit thinking that what if you surprise actually your fans? What if you don't tell them whoever buys a CD you just put, so you, you sign it or you put something personal. Yeah. So when they receive it, they, they, you exceed their expectations and they might yeah. even talk about it or make a video. I've seen this many times before. Yeah. Making videos, taking photos, you know. This Absolutely. Is spreading the word. Yeah, the more you can do to like amaze them and bring them into your circle, the better. So like some of the perks here are, you know, just the easy ones are like thank you tweets, Facebook shout outs. Those are the kind of the ones, they're always a low end perk. So maybe like five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever. Um, but you can get quite a lot of volume of them. But it's still quite cool to be like tweeted at uh, if, you, if, your band, if your fans love you. Uh, Skype lessons, that's actually a really, really successful perk. So give them an hour guitar lesson. Like how cool is that? You're teaching someone on Skype um, by their idol. Uh, giving them obviously digital copies of the album. So in terms of like pre-selling your album, it's, it's a great tool. Um, generally the people that fund you will want the your album or they'll want a ticket to your show um, so if you can sell tickets to the show or you can sell your album that's really good uh, saying on what you were kind of saying Tommy if you so we have this thing called a referral competition so the person that refers the most people to your campaign that results in the most contributions you can measure it on the back end and then you can offer a, a one-off featured perk so it might be that you offer a an exclusive gig to 20 of their friends um, and that's a hugely powerful motivation for people to get out there and just scream about your campaign and it might not be that 90% of the people that there that hear about it are going to contribute but that 10% um, might and will so yeah so if you can kind of surprise people or like yeah if it's a if it's a high-end perk or whatever there's a lot you can do there 